Uh, again, I shall wait a couple of minutes while everybody joins this new session. Uh, and while I'm waiting for everybody to join, I'm, I'll take advantage and introduce everyone to my two co-hosts here who will also help host uh, the tutorials over the next couple of days. We have uh, Filippo Levi from INRIM, the National uh, Metrological Institute of Italy, uh, and Stefan Schaefer from Copenhagen University. Stefan will give a talk tomorrow on, on his own research, and Filippo and Stefan will both help to share these sessions over the next couple of days, and, and have put a lot of work into organizing this workshop and indeed uh, coordinating the, the European projects that the, this workshop is, is based upon. Uh, while everybody is joining, uh, allow me to introduce our speaker for today, uh, for this second session. So we have today Daniel Benedicto from ICFO. I would say here in ICFO, but not everyone's physically here in Barcelona. Um, Daniel is working in the group of Morgan Mitchell, uh, running an, ex an ultra cold atoms experiment uh, with a spin or BEC, uh, and has been working on how to optimize uh, atomic clocks using uh, spin squeezing techniques. Uh, and so he, he's going to tell us a little bit about, uh, give us a bit of a, a tutorial introduction, uh, following on from the, the theme of Luca in the previous talk about how to use spin squeezing to optimize an, an atomic clock. Uh, I see that we have uh, more than 70 attendees, so I think that it's already time to, to begin. Again, if anyone has a question at any stage, please either raise your hand or type your question into the q and I'll pay attention to that and I'll give you the opportunity to ask your question directly to Daniel. Daniel, with that, I hand you the floor. Um, okay, thank you very much, Rob, for the, for the nice introduction. Uh, so, okay, so today my talk, if I can pass the slide, uh, will be about atomic squeeze states and atomic clocks. So, which obviously uh, I will be talking about how how to generate atomic uh, spin squeeze states and how they can be beneficial to atomic clocks. I think Luca uh, did already a, a very good job in introducing some of the basic concepts in in this uh, in this field. So, uh, during my talk, I I have divided it in kind of four sections. So I will start by giving some very basic introduction to uh, quantum metrology, what is quantum metrology, and what is the standard quantum limit in the, in the context of, uh, of atomic clocks. Uh, then I will present the, the main experimental methods that we have available for the creation of spin squeeze states in neutral atomic ensembles. And also, I will, I will try to show how this could be used in order to improve the, the stability of atomic clocks. Uh, then to, to finalize, I will, I will present a novel protocol that we are proposing, that we are developing with uh, our collaborators in, in, in Paris, in the group of Jerome. Uh, that uh, in which we, we use a measure, or we try to, to, to use uh, measurement induced spin squeezing in order to improve the sensitivity of atomic clocks. And I will show some very, very, very preliminary results that we, that we got. Uh, so let's start with the first question. So what is quantum metrology? So uh, to me, quantum metrology uh, refers to any kind of metrological tool or technique that allows us to improve the statistical uncertainty of a physical measurement below the standard quantum limit. So, okay, what is the standard quantum limit? Uh, this is a rather generic, a rather generic term that refers in, in, in general to the quantum limitations that constrain the measurement of an observable in a physical system. So we have already seen in the previous talk that um, what they are, what it is for uh, in the context of, of atomic clocks, and I will try to, to revise this very briefly. Um, so in order to do that, I, I, we, can, we can start by thinking uh, of a spin half particle, which in a given Hilbert space uh, will be represented by the state vector psi. And we, we know that its components along the three spatial directions uh, are given by the expectation values of the Pauli matrices. So this uh, 
gives us a, a vector, a three component vector that we can think of uh, pointing uh, in, this, in, the, along, in, this, yeah, in the surface of a sphere. So this sphere we call the, the, the block sphere and it is uh, the typical representation that we use. And uh, within this sphere, provided that the, that the length of the vector is fixed, all we need to know uh, to determine the, the state of the particle are two angles, theta and phi. And we can write the, the general state of the, of the particle system as, the, as a linear superposition of the, of the two possible uh, spin states of the, of the particle. So doing a simple analogy, we can see that any particle which has only two available uh, energy states down and up, then uh, not necessarily spin half, it can be also represented by a linear superposition of uh, these two states. So uh, we, can, we can use this uh, block sphere, this way of representing our, our state of the particle uh, in the case of a many, many, many particle system where we can use the collective operators, which is simply the, the sum of the individual uh, spin of, uh, particle operators, and where the general uh, state of the system can be given as the product state of the, as the direct product state of the individual uh, particle states. So, <clears throat> okay, just uh, very, just, just to mention that the that the collective operators of the of this system they also obey the, the angular momentum and commutation relations and the corresponding uncertainty relations. So this is important because these uh, uncertainty relations they reflect uh, fundamental quantum properties of the system and tells us about the resolution limits in projection measurements uh, in this in this kind of states. So now we can we can define what a what a coherent spin state is. Uh, I will give a very formal definition, which is so a, a coherent spin state is defined as the eigenstate of a spin component along its pointing direction. So this is very formal, but it can be very well understood and it can be very well visualized if we represent a coherent state on the block sphere, which is uh, this uh, this uh, this state here where uh, so all the all the all the spin components are uh, pointing along the same direction in the in the y direction and therefore we can write the we can write the 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 state of the system as the direct product of the single particle uh, states so so let me say here that sorry um, I don't find the mouse. Yeah, okay, so this, uh, this state has to fulfill the, the uncertainty relations. And uh, in this case, uh, it has to do with the quantum fluctuations of the, of, the, of the spin state along the orthogonal direction of its pointing direction. So in this case, the direction X and Z. Uh, so we can see that in order to fulfill these uncertainty relations, these quantum fluctuations ha has to be at minimum uh, square root of n over two, and this is what we call um, a coherent spin state. So now uh, we can uh, we know what is a coherent spin state, and we can go back to our original question of what it is the standard quantum limit. So, and in this context, the, the standard quantum limit will refer to the best achievable precision on the estimation of a physical quantity in a system of uncorrelated particles, so a coherent spin state. So in, in this uh, kind of picture that we are considering, uh, we could ask, for instance, uh, what it is the angle of the state, so we, uh, and moreover, we would like to know not only the angle itself, but also how well we can determine this quantity. So what is the uncertainty in that measurement? And this was already uh, explained uh, well by, by Luca in the previous talk. So we can, 
we can just make a measurement of, of these states, some projection measurement of the, of the state of the system along a given direction. So for example, here we could try to use the, the X direction and then working through the, the error propagation formula and applying the simple maths, then we could, uh, we could achieve, we, we could um, obtain what would be the uncertainty in the estimator of our parameter. So in the case of a single spin hot particle, this uh, variance in this, in this particular case is one. And uh, what happens in the case that we have many, many particles, so uh, n particle state. So we know that this uh, would be completely equivalent to repeating the same experiment n times. And then uh, the, the the statistics tells us that if we repeat the same experiment with exactly the same uh, the same initial conditions uh, during n times, then the, the variance of of the of the average of these of these uh, measurements scales as one over n, where n is the number of repetitions. So, in this case, if we use a coherent spin state with n particles, then we have a, an uncertainty. In the estimation of the of the angle that scales as one over n being the number of particles in the system so that's very good but how is this relevant in the in the context of uh, atomic clocks so again i will go through so if we consider that atomic clock uh, is uh, represented by a ramsey uh, spectroscopy sequence then we know that we can prepare a, a fully polarized state, so a coherent spin state in the in the ground state of the of the clock system. Then we can apply a pivot to rotation, which equally distributes the the population between the two clock states. Then there is some free evolution time during which the the uh, the phase between the two levels. Uh, evolves in time and this evolution is uh, is given by uh, omega t where omega is the rate of precession of the of the pseudo spin representation and then at the end of the of the sequence we apply another power to and we read out the state by a projection measurement so in this way Okay, so this is a small movie to to represent this this sequence. So it was already very well explained by Luca. Uh, and again, we can ask ourselves what is the what is the standard quantum limit in this in this kind of measurements. So when we are trying to estimate not the angle itself, but instead the 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 angular the angular frequency. So we can apply the same formulas as before, the error propagation formula and and uh, we obtain that the standard quantum limit in this case is given by one over the number of particles that we use in the clock uh, times the uh, interrogation time square. So now the question is, uh, can we do better than this? Uh, the answer is yes, we can do better. And uh, for example, we could, uh, so we, we can do better if we use um, spin squeeze states where uh, these are states where there are appropriate quantum correlations between the particles. And, uh, <clears throat> and then in, in, in this case, the, the, the quasi probability distribution of the, of the uncertainties of the state gets uh, squeezed in one of the orthogonal directions as we can see in this, in this figure in this cartoon uh, but however uh, we have to remember that there are always the, the uncertainty relations that then mean that the, the conjugate variable needs to be anti-squeezed so there is an extra noise in this in this uncertainty and uh, and uh, now well if, if we use this as our input state for the inter for the for the clock interferometer uh, then uh, the theoretical limit that we can that we can achieve is called the Heisenberg limit, and it is one over n squared. 
However, this is this is really this is really hard to achieve. So, but this is important because um, so we need to quantify how much squeezing we have we have in a system, and we do this by um, comparing the uncertainty in our estimation process with the uncertainty in the estimation of the same parameter uh, given a coherent spin state where uh, we use only uncorrelated particles and, and not entangled particles. Okay, so uh, this obviously uh, can be very good for, to, to improve the precision of several measurement devices. Uh, and this will allow to, this can allow to surpass the, the, the standard quantum limit sensitivity. So some possible uh, applications could be uh, atomic magnetometers or atomic clocks, or the most famous example, which are the, the gravitational wave detectors, although they don't use spin squeeze states, they use squeeze states of light. So now in the following, I, I will start to review a little bit how to generate spin squeeze states from, from an experimental point of view. And uh, there are, so we can use different, different methods that, that there are mainly three, which is collisional uh, dynamical squeezing, cavity, cavity mediated interaction squeezing, and measurement induced squeezing. So let's start with the dynamical squeezing. Uh, so we can think of a system which has uh, many atoms and, uh, and the particles in this system, they have only two possible states, A and B, and they, they have some interaction between them. So for instance, we can find this kind of system in, in uh, 87 rubidium, where we can find atoms in the two ground state manifolds, F equal one and F equal two. Uh, and uh, there exists some, some collisional interactions among these, these atoms. And then we can define our usual collective spin operators. And this, uh, this system basically gives rise to, to the, what we call the, the one-axis twisting Hamiltonian, which is non-linear in the, in the spin operators. And the non-linearity uh, means that the, there exists Two body coherence interactions represented by this uh, by this NB times NA term, and this gives rise, in fact, to uh, so the, the evolution of the system under this Hamiltonian gives rise to spin squeezing. So here in this uh, small movie. I have represented a, a coherent spin state, which under time. It evolves uh, under the under the effect of this one-axis twisting Hamiltonian, and it uh, develops a squeezed uh, a squeezed state in one of the orthogonal directions, while at the same time it rotates around around its center. So the the experimental realization of such protocol has been has been done, and uh, and it is shown in this uh, in this. Uh, plots from from a paper by Christian Gross. Um, so here in the so in order to to measure the, the the amount of available squeeze in the system, so we we have seen that the that the squeeze state rotates around its its center during the evolution. So a final coherent rotation is applied to to the state before measuring its projection along the along the z-axis. So in the plus, the, the x-axis represents the angle of this, of this final rotation. And on the y-axis, uh, we have the squeezing parameter that we have defined previously. So it is the uncertainty on the measurement uh, divided by the uncertainty of the equivalent measurement uh, using coherent spin states. And we can observe that as a function of the final rotation angle, the, there is a minimum for the squeezing parameter, which corresponds to a rotation of the angle that brings the, the squeeze state back into the, into the equator. So when you project uh, through your measurement, the uncertainty in this direction is, is minimum. So it was achieved a, a minimum of, uh, or a maximum squeezing of 9 dV was, was achieved using this, using this method. Uh, so, 
also we could try to think of using cavity mediated squeezing so this this is a little bit complicated and it's completely different uh, so let me let me try to explain this a little bit quickly so we can think of atoms uh, inside a cavity which uh, so they are trapped in in the in the wells of of uh, uh, trapping potential and now uh, we can think of sending some some other some probe light here which uh, interacts with the same atoms uh, for for the many round trips inside the inside the optical resonator so if we consider that this that these uh, particles can be in in two states for example here the, the, there is again we are going back to to rubidium atoms where the possible states are in the f equal one f equal two uh, manifolds uh, then, uh, if we also detune the, the the probe light exactly in the halfway between these two transitions, then what we have is that the index of refraction of the medium inside the cavity, so the, the atoms, is effectively changed by the by the interaction with this with this uh, light. And this change is proportional to the to the population difference between these other, these particles and these particles. So at the end, uh, so the, the the key point here is that the state of each atom now uh, depends on all the other atoms through the population difference, and these interactions is mediated by the light traveling back and forth inside the cavity. Uh, so this also creates some kind of nonlinear interactions, and the effect is similar to that of the that I was showing before of the one-axis twisting Hamiltonian. So the experimental result uh, of of this paper by Leroux, uh, Schleyer, Smith, and Bulatish uh, is given in in this plot where we have represented where they have represented exactly the, the the same quantities so on the x-axis the rotation angle of the of the state because it also uh, rotates around its center during during evolution and on the y is the normalized spin variance which means exactly the spin squeezing parameter that we have defined before and uh, once again uh, we can find that there are uh, for for different evolution times there are uh, the, the 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 variance of the measurement surpasses that of the measurement using uh, coherent spin states, which is the this black line over here. Uh, so what else? The, then let's go back to to the to the last technique, which is uh, quantum non demolition measurements, or well, measurement induced spin squeezing. Uh, using quantum non-demolition measurements. So, <clears throat> so first of all, what is a quantum non-demolition measurement? So th these are uh, two conditions that a QND measurement has to satisfy, a little bit hand-waving. Uh, first is that it needs to be repeatable. It means that the, the, the measurement should not disturb the system. So we can probe the same uh, the same atomic state uh, different times without having to prepare it uh, from scratch. So then the second condition is that it needs to be weak in, this, in, in the sense that the amount of entropy uh, that the measurement introduced in the system uh, is just to satisfy the, the uncertainty relations. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> Okay, so th th then in this in this kind of in this kind of uh, picture, the the squeezing is generated by uh, by consecutive measurements of the state observable. So, by measuring many times the same observable of the system, then the the uncertainty in the later in the later measurement is diminished due to the due to the the previous uh, measurement record that we have. And uh, in fact, we could think of uh, QND measurements of the following type, where, uh, where instead of measuring the, 
the system in a in a projective way so we uh, directly measure measuring the projection of the system we we kind of couple the, the spin system here to an external observable to an external meter let's say which is uh, for example it could be some 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 probe light and then this probe light when when it interacts with the with the system itself it acquires some different properties uh, that depend on the state of the of the spin system and we could read out this uh, these external variables so in this way we could we could uh, gain information about our our system without perturbing it and that would satisfy the conditions of uh, q and d measurement uh, so let's give now a couple of examples of this kind of uh, spin squeezing generation. Uh, so actually, this has been the, the most successful uh, method to, to generate spin squeeze states. And uh, uh, we, so it was done, it was realized in the context of a, of a cavity system where the atoms are sitting again in the, in the, in the wells of the, of the trapping potential. And we we apply uh, the, the the same thing. So we apply some probe light, which is uh, halfway detuned between the two uh, system states. Again, this this is reading, and we have this optical transition available, which can address at the same time the the up and, and down state. And by applying this kind of uh, measurement in use uh, technique, so we measure repeatedly the, the, the state of the system uh, by reading out the, 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 probe, the, the probe light variables, then they generated a, a, a record high uh, squeezing of 22 dBs. So the second example uh, also uses rubidium and also uh, is realized in, a, in an optical cavity but it is somehow different here instead of using an optical transition that addresses both uh, both clock states it addresses only a single state this is uh, this was done in order to in order to reduce the the back action into of the measurement into the spin state so it was a, a little bit of technicalities there uh, and the, and the scheme is slightly different, but also uh, they could create a, a nice squeezing of, of 10 dBs. So, okay, so we have reviewed now several ways of, of creating spin squeeze states, and how can we apply this to, to clocks? So, as uh, Luca was highlighting in, in his talk, uh, clock, um, is a, a quantum parameter estimation problem and uh, and where okay where the, the the clock works in a in a kind of feedback uh, feedback system so we couple the the laser or or the local oscillator to the atomic reference through some kind of uh, measurements of the of the state and then we apply and then we apply some feedback so uh, so this okay so then we can we can do again the, the we can follow the, the same the same logic that we were uh, seeing before and we can try to estimate the the phase of the laser phi uh, through the measurement of, of the through the projection measurements of the of the spin state and these uh, two quantities are related uh, as he was explaining much better than than i am doing uh through through the error through the error propagation formula so this means that the the clock measurements are in fact limited by the standard quantum limit in the case that we use uncorrelated particle so can we do better than that uh, yes in principle we could do better than that but uh, we have to to keep in mind that uh in order to assess the the, the performance of a clock uh, we cannot only look at the at the variance of a single measurement so but we need to look at their stability because they are 
they are a stability problem. They are they are working in, within a feedback loop, and this uh, stability is typically measured by the Allen variance. So Luca has pointed out very uh, has been proposing new schemes in order to to reduce um, the effect of the laser diffusion in in this uh, in the stability of the clocks. And here, instead, we will focus a little bit of uh, reducing the, the quantum projection noise of the measurements uh, in order to improve the in order to improve the 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 Allen variance of the of the clock. Uh, so let me just go quickly through through the different kind of uh, effects that limit the stability of current atomic clocks. So first of all, as we have seen, is the is the quantum projection noise of the spin state that we know we can improve by by creating spin squeeze states. Uh, then there is the so-called Dick effect, which is an aliasing effect uh, between the high frequency noise of the of the laser that, that it is used in the interrogation. Uh, with the cycling time of the experiment. So every time we need to perform an experiment, uh, a Ramsey sequence, we have some state preparation. And this is at that time for the, for the feedback because during this time we are not interrogating the atoms. So we don't know what the phase of the, of the local oscillator is doing. And, and, this, uh, and this has a, a, an important effect in the, in the stability of the, of the feedback. Then the, the, the last uh, effect is the laser diffusion that Luca has explained much better, and it has to do with the with the enlargement of the uncertainty of the of the of the laser laser frequency before interrogating the atom. So um, so this this has to do with the with the coherence time of the laser itself. That as he was mentioning. It, it it is grounded on the way that we build uh, like mechanically we build the, the these ultra narrow uh, lasers so in order to illustrate these uh, effects i have taken this uh, this graph uh, from a recent preprint of one of the collaborators in this consortium uh, where they show the Allen variance for, for a, an interrogation time of one second as a function of the number of uh, atoms in the, in the clock uh, for different, in different conditions. So we can see that there are different ways in order to improve this, uh, this stability. So first of all is by increasing the number of atoms, but this has a limit because we cannot put like infinite number of atoms in the system then uh, we could also think of reducing the the dead time of the measurement so the state preparation as we can see this is actually a, a, an important effect uh, so here the the dead time is represented by td and so we can see how by lowering it by three orders of magnitude then we we can achieve a, a much better stability uh, which is uh, the 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 blue the blue line compared to the to the to the black lines, and the the third effect is uh, trying to use spin squeeze state instead of coherent spin states, and this we can see that in all the cases, improving the quantum projection noise in the in the single shot measurements, then it improves the stability of the of the of the clock for a given for a given number of atoms, so then in theory, uh, this this looks promising. So this is easy. All we need to do is to apply all our ideas about spin quizzing, generate spin squeeze states that we know how to do. And we can do we can do well, and then use them as input states for the for an ideal interferometer. And this will look something like uh, what I'm representing here, where we create, uh, so first we start with a coherent state, then we somehow evolve it into a spin squeeze state, and then we perform our interferometric measurements. So, but this obviously is not how reality works. And there are, there are many 
limitations that uh, that make this actually really hard to to implement in in clocks. So first, uh, dynamical squeezing requires the evolution under a nonlinear Hamiltonian, and this can be quite complicated to to accomplish. And the states are really hard to create, and it's hard to work with from the from the experimental point of view. Uh, also, if we if one tries to squeeze the state too much, then the anti-squeeze quadrature, uh, together with technical instabilities, they start to to bend too much. The the the, the squeeze state starts to wrap around the block sphere, and uh, different effects uh, come into play, and they are detrimental at the end for the for the projection measurements. So they are so these these are not ideal ideal spin squeeze states to use. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we could think of using Q and D measurements that are uh, are good to generate uh, squeeze states up to 22 degrees of squeezing. We have seen that this is possible. Uh, but however, the, the drawback here is that there is no direct application of that protocol in, in current optical clocks because the, the energy level structure of good clock atoms, or so typically alkaline Earth-like atoms, like strontium or ytterbium, in these atoms there is no uh, access to, there is no direct access to an optical transition that can address uh, these uh, two clock states. So it is not possible to apply this technique here. So after all this we have seen, so I feel a little bit like when I look at this picture, like something is uh, out of place. So we have reviewed uh, some techniques to generate spin squeeze states, uh, but neither of them seems very practical or that gives us a huge meteorological gain that would be worth the effort. So uh, what else? So can we think of using any of the spin squeezing generation techniques that we already know in a different way that will allow us to take advantage of, of uh, full meteorological advantage of this, of the non-classical states generated? So this is basically asking, can we improve the quantum projection noise in, in current atomic optical clocks in a different way than, than the ways that we know already? So uh, we think the answer is yes. And, uh, and we, we basically focus on, on Q and D measurement type. So in the context of atomic clocks, the Q and D measurements are interesting not only because they can be, they, they have application in creating uh, spin squeeze states, but also they are super interesting because they could allow uh, dead time free protocols. So they could help uh, to implement uh, clock, uh, clock measurements without, without dead time, without state preparation. So that would reduce uh, the dick effect and that would give a, a huge improvement over the stability of the clock. So, and in fact, there are several, several proposals uh, how to realize q and measurements in, in the context of, of clocks. So here I will give one, just one example, uh, which was developed at CIRTE by, by the group of Jerome, in which uh, they, they use uh, heterodyne measurements of the of the phase of the probing laser to extract the information about the population of the ground state of the clock. So in in here they uh, they also they are working on a on a cavity, and they uh, the this technique is a little bit sophisticated. So I will just give a little bit of flavor uh, and. So they send probing light through the uh, through the system, which is resonant with the one s zero one p one transition of uh, of strontium, and they modulate this light at a given frequency, and at the same time they use a cavity in order to select the the sidebands that are injected into the into the cavity. So. Uh, so sorry. 
so they, they also tune the system in such a way that only uh, two symmetric side ones, the minus one and the plus one, uh, are, coupled, are coupled into the cavity. So this, uh, this also solves a very important problem, uh, which is uniformly coupling the probing light uh, to the atoms, because the, typically in, in clocks, uh, you want to work with a trapping light which matches the, the, the magic wavelength. So you, you can get rid of, the, of some systematic uh, errors. And this typically is not good in order to perform probing light with, with a certain uh, interest in the tunings. So, <clears throat> so, uh, so in this way, they, they managed to do that and extract information about the, about the ground state uh, population of the, of the system. So could, could we think of taking advantage of this already implemented protocol in, and try to, to generate measurement in this squeezing in this, uh, in this kind of scheme? So we, we think it, it, is, it is possible and, and we are collaborating with them and developing a new measurement protocol that will allow us to uh, perform uh, QND measurements that generates squeezing the system that then later we, we, can, we can use in order to improve the quantum projection noise. So the, the protocol uh, has three different, three different elements, so which is state preparation, on which uh, we assume that we can prepare a, a coherent spin state for the, for the input state of our interferometer. Then uh, we are thinking of using a Rabi-like uh, sequence. So instead of using a Ramsey, a Ramsey type of uh, protocol, uh, real clocks are actually uh, working on Rabi-like sequences because of actually because of the current limitations of the coherent time of, of the lasers and the, and the state preparation time. And so we think that this is more realistic and it can be applied uh, and it could be applied. Uh, and uh, the, the third element is a set of discrete quantum non demolition measurements uh, that will allow us to, to create the, the, the desired uh, squeeze states. So if we put this into a kind of schematic diagram in time, it will look something like that. So where we have some dead time for the, for the state preparation. And then we have a, a Rabi-like driving. So just driving uh, uh, the population, uh, the population uh, floating in the, in the clock states. And at some times in this, in this, during this uh, oscillation, we, uh, we, we send some, some QND measurements and we extract information about the system. So why do we need three measurements? So we, we, are, we have been thinking about this minimal protocol using three measurements because uh, two measurements is not enough uh, in order to extract the, the, the full information of the, of the system because what we are doing is basically, so here, this, is, this might be a little bit confusing because I'm mixing a real, real space representation with a pseudo spin representation. So what I want to address here is that through this kind of QND measurements, we can get the, we can measure the, the length of the vector, of the spin vector of the ground state, of the clock state. Uh, so when we are doing our, our Rabi-like sequence, uh, which corresponds to a, a rotation in the pseudo-spin representation, then what happens is that the length of this uh, vector in real space will be diminished. And then if we measure again, we will obtain information again about this length, but we will know anything about this, uh, the, about the upper state. So in order to determine the state of the system, we, we will need at least two measurements. And uh, this is required to uh, create a, um, uh, to create a measurement induced spin squeezing. So we need at least two measurements in order to to generate the spin the squeezing of the state, and then after measurement to read out the 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 state with uh, with a reduced uncertainty. 
And why uh, are we working on this uh, since we are not a traditional club group? Is because this protocol can be tested in current experimental setups using 87 rubidium. So the analogy follows quite clearly if we compare the energy level structure of rubidium and strontium atoms. So we, we know that uh, rubidium has two uh, clock states, which are these two, which can be addressed through, uh, a, through two photon transitions of microwave and RF uh, photons. And uh, so this will be the equivalent to the optical transition between the 1s0 and 3p0 clock state in strontium. And also we can apply some Q and D uh, measurements in uh, that addresses only one of the two clock states, as uh, as this transition does in the in the protocol that was uh, proposed at CIRTE. Uh, so in 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 the case of rubidium, instead of doing these uh, heterodyne measurements, what we do is we we, we use paramagnetic Faraday rotation measurements. Uh, in order to, to perform these Q and D measurements. And this is something that uh, we understand very well and the group has a lot of experience with. Uh, so the, 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 full, the full modeling of, of, this, uh, of this system is, is based on the, on the covariance matrix approach, which is a, a well-known method to, to treat near Gaussian states. And uh, it also has the advantage that it allows us to introduce in the, in the modeling in a very handy way, a lot of different sources of noise. And also uh, we can include in the picture the description of the, of the variables that do not, uh, some variables that do not uh, uh, belong to the quantum system, but for example, we can include the, the the classical variables that will represent the, the laser driving uh, frequency and, uh, and strength. So uh, now I will give some very preliminary results of, of the protocol that we are, that we are uh, developing. So the, the, first of all, I will show the evolution of the atomic variables and variances uh, under the under the under this this picture. So we have seen that in the protocol uh, we can prepare a, a fully polarized state along the along the GZ and then try to to um, to implement some gravity driving. So this is uh, in terms of the atomic variables, this is very simple and really uninteresting because all what happens is that the population is flipping between the, these two states. However, uh, it is, uh, and, the, and the Q and the measurements do not modify this, this evolution significantly at least. Um, uh, however, the, if, we, if we plot the variances of the atomic variables, the evolution of the variances of the atomic variables, we can see that they are highly modified by our three uh, Q and D measurements. So we can see that uh, here at the beginning, there is one Q and D measurement, then there is another one here, and there is uh, one at the end. So the, the steep change uh, is because the Q and D measurements take uh, really like no time as compared to the to the Ravi to the Ravi sequence so we see as, a, as an instant change in the in the in the evolution and we can see how uh, this highly modified evolution gives rise to some available squeezing here at the very end where I have normalized the variances by the standard quantum uh, by the standard quantum limit of the of the of a coherent state. So we can see that we have some available squeezing in the system that we could try to use it in order to improve the, the clock measurements. So how can we do this? So now uh, our quantum parameter estimation, single quantum parameter estimation problem, uh, which is typical of Ramsey-like sequences, uh, which uh, we have seen already, then it becomes a multi-measurement parameter estimation problem where we have uh, three measurement outcomes that corresponds to three optical three readouts of the of the optical variables, and so we need to to build up an estimator that takes into account 
um, an, an estimator for the variance that takes into account all these measurement record that we have. And uh, when, we, when, we, when we do so, we can, uh, we can show what, what is the estimation uncertainty of, the, of, our, of, our, of our measurement following our protocol. Uh, so in, in this plot, I show some preliminary results that show the, the uncertainty in the estimation of the detuning of the laser. Uh, as a function of the detuning itself. So, and we can see that there are, there are uh, I, will, I will focus here on this region, where, which is where the, where the minima of, the, of these plots are. And uh, I, I will say that the, the, the blue line is the result of this uh, protocol uh, in, a, in a very naive, naive way meaning naive meaning that these uh, these two timings here are a pi over two rotation and then a full rotation a two pi rotation of the state and uh, the q and d measurements are applied in between this pi over two and pi and two pi rotations so then uh, we we could think can we do better than this uh, and uh, since we are working with uh, analytical expressions, we could try to optimize um, to optimize this uh, this uh, our target parameter, which is the, the 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 variance of the of the measurements, uh, and the, the and the things that we can optimize are the the timing of these measurements and the strength of the of the measurements. So if we uh, if we optimize just the timings. We obtain something, some other uh, optimal detuning uh, for for our for our clock laser, which gives us an, a reduced uncertainty with respect to to our first naive uh, option. And uh, furthermore, if we include in the optimization problem the, the strength of the measurement, then we can see how. Uh, we can reduce further the, the uncertainty in this in this measurement. So this in this way we 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 see that we can we can highly improve the single uh, the single shot sensitivity of atomic optical clocks by using a novel protocol based on Q and D measurements. And uh, with this, I, I would like to finish, and I would like to thanks uh, to the whole quantum and atom optics group, which is led by Morgan Mitchell, and to the Spinner BC team, which is uh, myself and, and three PhD students, Chiara, Enes, and Stuti, and also especially to Rob because he was very helpful uh, during the the. the the development of, of this protocol. So thank you and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Daniel. So I, I shall again open the floor for, for questions. We have about six minutes um, for, for questions available. Um, so uh, if you would like to ask a question of Daniel, please raise your hand and again I will give people the floor to ask the question directly with a microphone, or if you prefer, type a question into the Q&A and I'll, I'll read it out to, to Daniel myself. Uh, I'll invite also Filippo, Stefan, if you would like to ask a question of, of Daniel, then please um, join in as well. So, perhaps, uh, perhaps I can start, if that's please, okay. Please, Stefan. Um, so thank you for a very nice talk, uh, first of all. Um, you show this uh, this nice uh, measurement sequence where if you if you have the the um, the quantum non demolition measurements, you can make a series of measurements uh, after preparation before you need to prepare the atoms again. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So what time? What what kind of duty cycle would this be able to give you? Is there a limitation to that still? So uh, here we are assuming that we uh, that this can be implemented in in current uh, optical lattice clocks. So the state preparation would be 
uh, the time that the that the experiment takes to load the the, the atoms in the in the clock state, so typically half a second, and and then uh, we assume that we can run the 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 Rabi oscillation for another half a second or or maybe more. It depends on the on the coherence time of the of the laser, uh, but typically. Uh, the the Ravi the Ravi sequences in in current in current clocks they, they take around two hundred and fifty milliseconds or something, so we are thinking around these these lines. Thank you, Stefan, for the question. Does anyone else have a question? Please raise your your hands. Uh, Luca Pezza, we have a, a question from the floor. Would you like to ask the question live? I'll give you the the floor. Uh, no, it seems I'm not able to do that. So, look, I'll read the question for you. Uh, so, look asks, do you have a loss of coherence as a bit back reaction due to the Q and D measurement? Is this taken into account in the simulations and optimization? And does it pose limitations? So, a loss of coherence due to the, the back action from the Q and D measurement. Yes. So, in fact, we, we take into account this... Uh, uh, this uh, this effect and it is already included in this in this uh, in this plot. So if I plot the the same the same graph without the without this uh, this loss of coherence, then we can see that it improves a little bit, but it's not that dramatic. Uh, so in the case that that we are considering here, it doesn't suppose a, a dramatic change in the in the variance of the measurement. This is probably because we are we are using already uh, weak measurements. So the, the the number of photons that we send into the system is already kind of optimum because it's what we yeah what we know that it works. So so yeah. Good. Uh, I don't see any other hands being raised or questions being asked, but we do have time for one more. Uh, we do have a question from Michele Gozzellino. Uh, although that hand was quickly put down, so maybe there's not a question there. Uh, I'll allow an, another question. And while we are waiting to see if there's a, another question from the floor, I shall put up the link in the chat to the first talk tomorrow. So here you'll see a Zoom link for the first talk tomorrow. Tomorrow from two o'clock, we have a talk on Rydberg clocks from Matthew Jones from Durham University, and a talk on super radiance in atomic clocks from Stefan, my co-host here from uh, Copenhagen University, as well as a poster session following that, where we have contributed posters from students uh, who are attending uh, the session, which uh, will include uh, flash talks from all of the poster presenters, and then a virtual poster session where everyone will have a chance to talk to the presenters directly of each of those posters and interact with them. Uh, so I don't see any more questions coming from the floor. So with that, I would like to thank again, Daniel, for your presentation. Uh, everybody for attending the talk both of the talks uh, today and to our, our previous presenter, Luca, uh, for his talk earlier today. Uh, and I would look forward to seeing everybody at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon for our first talk. And as I say, this is on Rydberg Clocks by Matthew Jones from Durham University. Uh, you should all have a, a link via your email accounts, uh, but I've also put the link up in the, the chat of the session here. And if anybody that you know, a friend, a colleague, uh, a student is interested in joining, please note that anyone is able to join uh, to register to any of the talks uh, by following the, the Zoom links that we've been sharing via email, et cetera, uh, at any time. So more participation is very welcome at any stage. Thank you to everybody for the talks today. Thank you to everybody for attending and I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.